Well, this morning, we're going to look at a very, very famous passage of Scripture. One that you might see this morning. John 3, 16. Where will you see it? On the Denver side of the field. I don't really care if Denver wins. I just like to give my kid a bad time. He, we like Michael Orr, and uh, so we're big fans of his too. So, Anyway, yes, John 3.16. Let's read this passage. John 3.16-21. through 21. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. Now, it's important for us to take a moment and just note. If you have one of those red letter edition Bibles, what color are the words in this section? No, they're black. These are not Jesus' words. These are the commentary of John speaking to an event and expounding upon the theological truth in that event. Nicodemus meets Jesus, remember, in the first part of John? And Jesus gives him that famous discourse about being born again. You have to remember that Nicodemus was searching. We don't know where Nicodemus' heart was at the time, what he took away from the event, but we do know that later, when Jesus was taken off the cross, Nicodemus steps back into the picture. So obviously, the words that Jesus shared with him had an effect on his heart. We believe, and at least I believe, that Nicodemus came to faith. And for that reason, John makes this commentary about this moment in time this truth that has been shown, that you must be born again. You must be born again. It is not an option. It is a choice. A choice that in, if you take it, if you choose to let God's Son into your heart, you will be born again. You will pass from one stage of life into a different stage of life. From, as John calls it, from darkness into light. So let's look at what John has to say about this very important rebirth. John takes it to a cosmic relevance. For God. For God. For God. God. It starts with Him. It starts with God. It does not start with our understanding of Him, our perception of Him, our need for Him, or our lack of need for Him. It starts simply with Him. It is, we are irrelevant. Irrelevant to what God wants to do in His purposes. God created, I believe, for His own joy. I believe God did something because He loves. As we are told in 1 John 4, 7, 8, God is love. I think He couldn't help Himself. 
He did something miraculous and beautiful. He created the world. And within that creation period of seven days, as the Bible describes it, He creates the pinnacle of His creation. He creates man and then woman together. And they are one. And God loves what He's done. God loves the world. And yet that world fell away from it, rebelled against Him. Adam and Eve, our first parents, chose to go their own way, to disobey, and to break covenant relationship with God. And God knew, I believe this, in His infinite wisdom and knowledge, that in order to be free agents and to love, you have to have a choice. You have to have a choice. God allowed man that choice and to suffer the consequences of that choice. But God also had a remedy for that choice. That God in His holiness desires people who are holy to be with Him. But being incapable of truly being completely holy, God provided a way for us to have one who was holy bear upon Himself and in Himself our sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The charge. You see this sermon I'm calling This is the Verdict. It comes from a portion of the Scripture this morning. This is the Verdict. And we have to stop back, sit back and think about why John uses that phrase in verse 19. Well, first there's a charge made. We think of the term, the Verdict, as a legal term. A Verdict, some people have mistaken and thought it's a judgment. It's not just a judgment. It's a specific type of judgment. It is a judgment that is brought to its fruition because a charge is made. A violation of some sort has taken place. There is something that has broken the law. And there is someone who stands accused. And there is someone who has to take ownership and responsibility for the broken law. When we see this charge, we understand it in this first part of this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through Him. That says that there is the possibility of condemnation. That is a terrifying word, or it should be, to be condemned. It used to mean, the word condemned, to be put in a position where one's life would be taken from them. Maybe permanently through death, but also you can have your life taken away by being imprisoned. Having your freedom stripped from you. Not being able to live freely as you would choose each day. But we're first noticed, not so much the heaviness of the charge, but almost the remedy before it's even expounded out to us. For God so loved the world. I think John wants to point out something to us here. He wants us not to get hung up on the issue of condemnation because that's very easy to get hung up on. I don't know about you, but I have most of my life, as a Christian especially, felt this sense of unworthiness because I know that I'm a sinner. And except for God's grace, except for His grace, I would be condemned. 
I know that I'm not a perfect man. I know I have thoughts that run through my head that, that wouldn't be good, aren't good. I know I've lit words out of my mouth that didn't bless. Instead, they sometimes cause division and hurt. Heck, give me 10 minutes with my kids. I can show you what a real mess I can be. And I'll bet there are a lot of men in this sanctuary today who feel that inside. And yet we don't stand condemned as much as we stand loved. And John wants us to take a moment and think of God's nature. You know, some people have a very difficult time reading the Old Testament. Seems like a God of judgment lives there. And maybe that's true to some extent. But I found three passages of Scripture that talk about God and His love. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7, And He, God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abiding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet He does not leave the guilty unpunished, He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. There is a consequence to life. But behind that, there is also a God who stands, who is loving, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, the Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath He swore to your ancestors that He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And then Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him and brought out of Egypt, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burnt incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it. It was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness and with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. There's this wonderful picture of God and His love throughout the Old Testament. This same God who oftentimes was judging and holding people to account was also telling them He loved them. And his, he has love for his whole creation. God sent. God sent his son. It's interesting that Paul echoes these words in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And I love the way that Paul puts this. Born of a woman, born under the law. That same law that people violated in the Old Testament. To redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your heart. The Spirit of the One who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And since you are His child, God has also made you an heir. God sent. God sent His Son. God sent His Spirit. There is no deeper affection than one can have than to tie one's life to another. If you have a wonderful spouse 
and a good relationship with that person, you know how deep that relationship goes. And that doesn't even pale in comparison to what God desires to have with you and me when He places His Son into our lives and more importantly, His Spirit into our hearts. I love the way that Paul puts this because when God puts the Spirit of His Son into our our hearts, we get something that only Jesus could have possibly had. The Spirit calls out, Abba, Father. In Aramaic, Abba means Daddy. It's a deep term of deep affection. Someone once said, anybody can be a father, but it's hard to be a dad. Now, we all have our way we feel and experience words, but father sometimes feels a little removed to me. Dad, daddy. is that intimate relationship of deep affection and dependence and love. I feel it and felt it for the first time when my son called me something like that. He didn't quite get it right. It was dadu. And I wore that like a badge of honor. My kid called me dad too. That's who I was for many years. My kids have kind of grown out of it, but what a fond memory. What a deep emotional connection I had to my kids that that time that I felt that. And you know, I think God feels that when we depend on Him when we look at Him and see He loves us. He's there for us. He accepts us regardless of what we might feel about ourselves inside or the things we've done or the things we've said. And my kids have said plenty of things that I just shake my head at. They've done plenty of things I shake my head at. And it doesn't matter because they're still my kids and I'm still... Dad do. It's why we understand and feel God's unconditional love extends to us. We experience that unconditional love because of His grace towards us. How even though we might trip and stumble and fall and fail, God still loves But that unconditional love has boundaries. That unconditional love is reserved. And there's a clause in this passage that we need to stop and think for a moment about. It's verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. That's where the unconditional love fits. When you believe in Jesus Christ, God's unconditional love is there for you. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. God still loves them. God still offers His love to them those who don't accept Him and His Son. Not believing in God is tenement, or not believing in God's Son is tenement to self-condemnation. It's a personal choice. Just like choosing to love God is a choice. Choosing to accept Jesus Christ is a choice. It's yours. No one can make it for you and nobody can pass it on to you as a gift. It's something that you and you alone have to choose. You know, it's interesting because I've watched parents over the years and I've watched relationships with children dissolve seemingly in very difficult ways. Heck, even in my own home. With my sister and myself and my mother, I see a relationship between my sister and my mother that is dissolved and my sister hasn't spoken to my mother for almost 30 years. And I think about my own children 
what would that do to me if they chose not to have me as dadu anymore? What pain would be in my heart? And I can only imagine that God experiences that too. The condemnation that sets up against those who choose not to love Him is there, and it's their choice to make that choice. But what pain there must be in the Father's heart for those that He loves that do not choose His Son. And then we come to verse 19, the verdict. This is the verdict, John says, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. You know, sometimes evil has such a dark, foreboding sense about it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's simply a choice. It's simply the choice not to be loving in return. To not care in return for what God has done to show us His love. To take His one and only Son who lived a perfect, obedient life to His Father's will and to accuse Him falsely of things that He did not do. To spit on Him and curse Him. To whip Him and make Him bleed. To set a thorn of crowns upon His head. To nail Him to a cross. To continue to mock and insult Him. To walk away and let Him die. God knew all this was going to take place when He sent His Son into this world. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son When He gave His one and only Son, He knew that all of that was going to take place. The definition of a verdict, I started going down that road a while ago. The finding or decision of a judge or jury on a matter subjected to it for trial. The finding and decision of a judge or jury. A good judge understands the law, understands the accusation made against a person, and then meters the truth against the law, not the law against the situation. The law stands for a reason. It was God's choice. His love extended to an entire world because He chose to make His Son a sacrifice. His blood and His body, His life, the penalty, the payment for the penalty to satisfy the law. And God chose that those who would accept His Son would enjoy His love forever and those who rejected His Son would live with their decision forever. A defendant was on trial for murder. There was strong evidence clear evidence indicting and demanding this man's guilt. But there was one problem, there was no corpse. All the circumstantial evidence pointed to this person's death. This person's death came by the hands of the accused. In the defense's closing statement, the lawyer, knowing that his client would probably be convicted, resorted to an old trick. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he said, in one minute, walking through the doors of this courtroom, the deceased 
will walk in. All eyes in that jury turned to the back door. And after a long, long minute, no one entered. The jury was stunned. And then the fi- lawyer finally said, actually, I made up that entire previous statement, but you all looked on with anticipation. I therefore put it to you that there is reasonable doubt in this case as to whether or not anyone was killed and insist that you return a verdict of not guilty. jury went out and deliberated, came back, and the judge asked for the verdict, and they ruled guilty. But how, demanded the attorney, I showed you there was a reasonable doubt. And the foreman of the jury said, yes, when you pointed at that door and told us in one minute, the accused, the deceased, would walk through. We all looked. The problem was, your client didn't. So it begs a question. Where are your eyes pointed to? Do you see Jesus? Have you looked for Him? Because He is the answer to the accusations made against your soul and mine. Or are you looking away? God knows the difference. Do you? Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, thank You for this very important lesson that John shares with us. Thank You that You sent Your Son Jesus into this world that we would not be condemned We ask You, Lord, that You speak to our hearts and help us to point our eyes in the right direction. To look for Him. And to allow Him in. To have that relationship with You that is so close and so personal. So loving and so good. I pray, Father, for those in this congregation that are here with us this morning, that if they haven't looked to Jesus, they would look that way. Father, thank You for Your love for us. We ask that You walk with us today and take us from this place in Your care. Help us to go out into this world and to celebrate Your love for us in a way that will have other people looking around for Jesus too. Father, thank You for Your blessings upon us and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd encourage you if uh, you're wondering about Jesus Christ and His Lordship in your life, you know, and you want to make a decision to do that, to come up and talk to me after the service. Or talk to a friend that brought you that knows the Lord.